Here we are, once again, on the True Footy YouTube channel for the Eagles Corner to discuss the Eagles just getting annihilated 205-34 to 34 in a game for AFL football. And it's a result that I never thought, you know, I'd see from, from any Eagles side. Um, and when I say I never thought I'd see it, I mean, you know, like historically, like even 12 months ago, two years ago, three years ago, I never thought I'd see my team concede 200 points in a game in this fashion. But, you know... Over the last four to six weeks, if you'd asked me if we'd concede 200 points in a game, I'd thought, yeah, maybe, maybe it's possible. But now it's actually happened. And the way that it happened was disgraceful. So this is the first Eagles game I've, uh, I've seen live in a month. Obviously, I was away and uh, I was really excited for it. I knew we were going to get belted, obviously. I think I tipped Sydney by 42 and that was me being blindly optimistic. I didn't, deep down, I thought 42 was a little bit unrealistic, but uh, yeah, it was past 40. I think it was, yeah, 52 points at quarter time. I had a few beers last night, went out, made myself get home at one, um, to make sure I had six hours sleep to be able to get up and watch the Eagles. And by the time I worked through the VPN and uh, got KO fired up, uh, it was already 31 to six. Now we do have a, a tendency to have bad quarters. I know that might shock you, uh, but uh, early doors, I kind of just thought, all right, we've, we've started the game asleep and we'll come good, uh, but it never, never got better. The second quarter, there was an improvement. I think we were outscoring them three goals to one at one point, and I thought, okay, we're gonna stabilize from here, but the Swans kicked the last four of the quarter, I think, and by halftime, I thought 200 is genuinely on here. The third quarter is where it got really, really bad though, because uh, we were already competing to a certain degree, and losing by 70 points at halftime or whatever it was. But in the third quarter, we stopped trying. You could see the effort level just evaporated. They were so disheartened. There was absolutely no intent to try and limit the scoring. And the Swans, I don't know what the stats are. I can't be bothered going through this game and analyzing stats, but there was a, a flurry of about five or six goals. I think they kicked 11 goals in the third term. Um, and by that point, you know, I think it was like 167 to 30 around about three quarter time. It was beyond embarrassing already. And that was the funny thing about this game. And I use funny in a very non-literal sense. It was funny that um, the game was already so horrific by early in the third term that I've had time to come to peace with the result. You know, sometimes after a bad loss, um, you, you need time to adjust and let the emotions go. I've been doing that for like 45 minutes and the game just ended. I did have a shower to get this fucking game off my skin, but the emotion has gone a little bit, um, you know, late in the game. Uh, there's this weird, like sadistic part of me that as the score got closer to 200, I kind of wanted City to hit it. And I don't know why that is. Sometimes I just like to see records broken. We couldn't have been more embarrassed. You know, it doesn't matter if Sydney scored 198 points at the end. So I was like, they might as well hit it. But when that Hayden McLean goal went through and the score ticked over to 204, I felt disgusted. There is no other word to use um, for this Eagles effort other than disgraceful. And I don't say that lightly because I, as someone who has, you know, a, a, a platform talking about football, one thing I, I don't like doing is really going after players for being soft and not putting in the effort because I feel like as fans, it's a little bit rich for us who are sitting here at home watching games to be questioning players' commitment and how hard they go at the ball. But if we're looking at it fairly and in an AFL context as to how teams generally should play and where the Eagles are, it's, it's just night and day. And I mean, in terms of like baseline things like commitment and effort and desire to be want, want to be out there. And to be honest with you, I've played in some games like that in my football career, my short football career, where we would lose, uh, you know, the, the opposition team would score 200 plus and we'd score five goals for the game. So that was a pretty like normal result for the Nungaran footy club, shout out Nungaran. And I know what it's like to be in that environment. And, you know, in the third quarter, when you're 150 points down, um, you, you don't want to be out there. And, and I understand that feeling a little bit, but you know, I wasn't a like professional athlete. I was probably hung over back then, but it gets to the point where you just don't really want the ball. <laughs> and uh, I think that that happened way too early in this game. So it's crazy, like, you know, it, it must on the one hand seem boring to <coughs> analyze Eagles games repeatedly uh, where we've just been annihilated. But at, at, you know, at each juncture that I've done this, it, it's gotten worse. The narrative has gotten more dramatic. There is something new to add to the conversation. And now I think we're at the point where I, you know, I've been a Simpson defender, but like with results like this that are so pathetic and so embarrassing and damaging to the brand, we are a laughing stock. It's gotten to the point where, you know, I was a little bit active on Instagram during the game, sort of taking the piss out of the Eagles because that's how I deal with these things. But 
the replies from some fans, other than fucking you, Kat, um, they weren't even taking the piss. Like, they genuinely feel for us at the moment. And uh, that's not a position you want your football club to be in. Nobody wants to be in a position where it's just pity and concern. And I think everyone's wondering, how the hell do the Eagles get out of this mess? So on Simpson, this, this result is so damaging and so disheartening, and the players clearly don't want to be out there, then I think we're almost at the point where our hands are tied. We have to make a change. So, I mean, sure, you can make the argument in the when, when the, the cold light of day comes, when the emotions take out of it, what is the best thing for the football club at the moment? And I still think there's a fair argument to make that changing the coach right now isn't going to help. Realistically, is a new coach going to come in and improve? I'm skeptical because we still have so many injuries, um, but... I, and I've made the case that, you know, like we'd be setting up a, a, co- a coach to fail. But at the same time, this mix is not working. It cannot get any worse. And maybe a caretaker coach for the rest of the year would breathe a bit of life into this season. And the silly thing is, you know, we've made the injury excuse a fair bit. And against Adelaide, it was pretty valid, I thought, when you had like, we had no recognized defenders in that game. It was Rhett Bazo and a bunch of ragtag sort of medium, there was maybe a couple of recognized defenders in that team. Uh, but none of them like actual defenders, more like rebounders, like Hoff and um, Witherden and stuff like that. Jake Waterman was named at center half back and, and even he was a laid out. So that game, I can understand that, that it blew out. But the contest is where this game was really, really appalling. And I looked at the lineups going into the game and I thought, uh, okay, midfield is relatively strong. Yo, Kelly, Sheed, uh, Shuey was named in that team. And then a couple of youngsters like Jinby, Hewitt, and you know, backline still not great, but Barras came back into the side and it was about as strong as backline as we could have possibly fielded at any point this year. And it was actually the forward line that I was looking at and thinking there is no potency there. Um, you know, it was probably too tall, Allen, Darling, Williams, and Marrick. But the forward line was completely irrelevant in this game. I think we had two inside 50s to about 17 uh, early in the first quarter. And it was something like 79 to 26 by the end of the game, which is, yeah, probably the worst I've ever seen as well. So forward line functionality, just completely irrelevant in this game. There's no point even talking about it. So it was just the midfield that got annihilated. And there were so many times where we'd have a bit of a chain heading towards forward 50 and we'd look a little bit promising and somebody would fuck it up. But even more damaging was the fact that when we turned it over, Sydney had run and spread and were just overlapping us and getting inside 50s really, really easily. So again, it wasn't even, uh, I don't think you can even criticize the defense. There was too much of an avalanche of inside 50s and some of them were just really easy inside 50s where being an uncontested player running into the 50, they'd hit up a bullet pass and hit a target. It's, it's really, really hard to defend that. So you look at individuals and, and you know, Shui, there's a lot of criticism on Shui and we, there's going to be talk about how he should retire because of where we're at and stuff like that. But he was our best player on the field today. So whether or not he should retire, it's just a bit of irrelevant to this particular conversation. You know, Yo was solid. Kelly was decent as well. Um, and these guys kind of tried hard and statistically they were okay. So I think it's just the method and the defensive running, I think, that really butchered us in this game. But again, you know, I feel it feels irrelevant to try and like work through the mechanics of how we lost because at the core root of this issue is players that don't look like they want to be out there. It's a low point for the club. It is the lowest point for the club. That is undeniable now. Um, I remember thinking, you know, people have short memories. 2008 and 2010, we were really bad then too. It's not as bad as that. And then I went through the season results of those games because I'm a nerd. And uh, yeah, we are way worse than those years. Injuries is part of it, but it's so much deeper than that. And the rot has been there since the midpoint of 2021. Part of me is clinging on to the form we showed in the first three rounds where, you know, we weren't a good team, but we were a much improved team. Then the injuries hit and, uh, you know, we're not even treading water. We're just drowning at this point. So there's, there's two, you know, simultaneous conversations we need to be having about improving the Eagles right now. And one of them is the list management stuff. And that doesn't change, you know. We, we need to cycle through some of the older players. They need to... Uh, be replaced by high draft picks. That strategy will have been in place at the start of the year and that's irrelevant now. We need to do something to stop the damage, you know, between now and the end of the season. And, you know, I made a, a comment in a video recently about how I didn't think the Jaden Hunt recruitment made sense last year because he's 28 and demographically it's just wrong for us. But he's been probably top five in the BNF so far this season and God, we could do with another 28-year-old Jaden Hunt at the end of the year. But the elephant in the room is how the hell are you going to convince any half decent free agent to come and join the Eagles right now? I mean, you could look at some delisted free agents, but are they really going to improve us? We need to improve the bottom, oh, I was going to say bottom six because that's a common term in the AFL, but it's almost like the bottom 16. We need to improve that somehow uh, through some underappreciated players out of the clubs just to literally stop the damage 
uh, the emotional damage for fans, uh, but also, you know, psychologically for the players. This can't be good for them to be, you know, losing by, what was it, 171 points today? But between now and the end of the season, what do we do? What do we do? This feels uh, remarkably similar to, um, you know, the Mark Neal days at Melbourne. And, um, you know, I, I have faith that we will come back. We will come back. We just, we need to stick fat. And I'm going to be watching every game for the rest of the year, regardless, uh, you know, travel and time zone permitting. But, and in a silly, weird way, I'm going to be excited to see us lose by 100 points to St Kilda next week. But it feels weird to be this irrelevant. And it feels like a helpless situation, a hopeless situation between now and the end of the season. Um, we just need to stop this bleeding. And I, I got nothing for you. Should we talk about some positives? There was only a couple. Uh, I think Elijah Hewitt looked really good, to be honest. And when you consider how many passengers we have in this team, you know, Elijah Hewitt should spend the rest of the year in this side. He had, you know, about the same possessions as Gaff. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, was way more prominent, way more attacking. And he set up a goal with a really good kick. Um, I thought Chesser actually looked, uh, you know, a little bit more composed than he has ever had, uh, ever looked at AFL level. Um, sure, it was a bit of a dead game by the second quarter, but little things like him just being able to ride a tackle a little bit better. Um, he wasn't getting overawed. I think there's at least a, a development from where he was at the start of the year to now. So it'd be nice to see him continue that. Um, I don't think he's going to get a rising star nomination, but he is looking a little bit more comfortable at AFL level. I was really disappointed to see Luke Edwards get three touches. And I don't know how much to blame him because he's playing forward. He had three touches and negative 10 metres gain. And I just think, why not give him a crack on Andrew Gaff's wing? The amount of centre bounce attendances where uh, Gaff was on the, the broadcast side of the wing, where you can see he's getting plenty of time in there. Chuck Luke Edwards in there. Hide Gaff, drop him, whatever. But I, I've got this feeling that we're just going to ruin Luke Edwards and he's not going to get a, a fair go this year because I think he has been good on a wing at AFL level before. And, you know, if he gets 15 touches, that is better than what Andrew Gaff is uh, providing us right now. Anyway, I don't want to roast. It's a, it's a dreadful situation to be in. Um, it's embarrassing. It's disgraceful, to be honest. And I don't use that term lightly. Like I said, it's, uh, it's disgraceful. And the players really need to own up to what they're producing right now because the heads drop way too early in this game. The best excuse I can give them is a bit of burnout and they don't really care anymore. And that's probably a bit of a human thing. But, you know, half of these players, most of these players are playing for their careers now. I say now. They've been playing for them all year. Um, but, yeah. Anyway, those are just my thoughts, guys. Let me know in the comments what you think of this result. Um, I'm sure we're going to get a bit of... Uh, a bit of banter in the comments section, but fair enough, fair enough. And I, I honestly pray that this is the worst it's going to get, but I don't know anymore. I really don't know anymore. It could get worse than this. Who knows? And I think we picked up a couple injuries in this game, which is great. So anyway, appreciate you watching, guys. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. Um, tips for the St. Kilda game. Ooh. Think of you, Eagles fans. We just need to stick together. We, we have to have the faith. We don't have to be happy with what's happening. But things will improve. We will be back. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. I just, it can't keep going like this though. But thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.